Hello, everyone. Welcome to the University of Maine Cooperative Extensions Preserving the Maine Harvest webinar. I'm Kathy Savoy, and I will be joined today by two other of my colleagues, Kate McCarty and Lori Bowen, also with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Collectively, we have over 30 years of delivering home food preservation workshops, and we're really excited to launch this new adventure of providing webinars on a weekly basis. These webinars are designed for you to provide you with current USDA recommendations for preserving foods at home. We will feature foods in season corresponding with our main growing cycle. For example, today we're gonna have freezing rhubarb and also figuring out what to do with all of those great spring greens that are available now. A little uh, housekeeping. We have our webinar set up so that you can hear us and you can see us, but we cannot hear or see you. Know that we will have time for your questions throughout our presentation at specific times, but you can ask those questions by selecting the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and typing your question in the box. Remember to please use the Q&A feature, not the chat box. So thanks for joining us and let's get started. Spring here in Maine means there's a lot of hardy greens that grow well in our cold climate and they are readily available from your community supported agriculture share, your own garden, a farmer's market, or a local farm stand. These types of greens are often referred to as braising greens. To help you find local produce, our UMaine agriculture colleagues have created a great interactive directory on Maine farm products. So you can shop directly at farms. We encourage you to be sure to visit the farm's website or call first so you can learn how their policies have changed during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Know that we'll be sure to add this resource um, in the follow-up email to today's webinar. As we go through today's webinar, we'll talk about a lot of things that will be included in the email that will come to you after the webinar. So know that you will have access to those things. Some of you may be the more adventurous type and also like to source wild greens by foraging. There are some edible wild greens that are found in Maine, and these include things such as dandelion, purslane, lamb's quarter, orich, fiddleheads, and even ramps. We want you to be safe when you're foraging. So as always, make sure you know how to correctly identify what you're picking and are also very knowledgeable in the area where you are picking the greens from. Again, the follow-up email will include the link to our popular publication called Facts on Edible Wild Greens in Maine. This is a great publication. It has some really fun recipes in it, including one warm lentil and lamb's quarter salad with feta cheese. You'll also find recipes for each of the other greens that I mentioned, even dandelions. So this time of year, you may find yourself somewhat overwhelmed by the volume of greens that you're either able to grow in your own garden or buy. So freezing is really a great way to preserve them for easy use later on. Like most other vegetables, greens need to be blanched before they're frozen. We've queued up a video for you today, which is a demonstration on how to um, blanch greens and prepare them for the freezer. So we'll take a minute to watch this video and then continue on with our discussion after that. of all those great local Maine greens that are available in your own backyard, farmer's market, or farm stand. In general, greens are loaded with nutrients, including vitamin A and K, folate, calcium, iron, many phytochemicals, and fiber. Freezing is a simple, inexpensive, and very quick method of food preservation. Greens such as spinach, Swiss chard, beet greens, collard, kale, turnip or mustard greens freeze very well. 
blanching pot, ice bath, colander, salad spinner, paper towels, towel, tray, cutting board, and knife. Materials to freeze in need to be moisture vapor resistant, durable and leak proof, not become brittle and crack at low temperatures, and also protect foods from developing off flavors or odors. They also need to be easy to seal and easy to mark. Many greens are widely available and easy to find here in Maine. They include spinach, beet greens, kale, dinosaur variety, kale, curly type variety, Swiss chard, and a braising greens mix. Select young tender greens. Wash thoroughly and cut off woody stems. You can either leave greens whole or chopped. Plan ahead and consider how you will be using the frozen product. Blanching, scalding vegetables in boiling water or steam for a specific amount of time is a must for almost all vegetables before they're frozen. Exceptions include tomatoes, peppers, and onions. Blanching stops enzyme action, which can cause loss of flavor, loss of color, and texture. Blanching helps remove surface dirt and organisms, brightens the color, and helps stop the loss of vitamins. Greens require two minutes of water blanching, with the exception of collards that require three minutes. Use a blancher pot, which has a blanching basket and cover, or fit a wire basket into a large pot with a lid. Work in small batches and use one gallon of water per pound of prepared vegetables. Lower vegetables into vigorously boiling water. Once the water returns to a boil, start counting the blanching time. As soon as the blanching is complete, quickly cool greens to stop the cooking process. Plunge greens into an ice bath for the same amount of time they were blanched for, two minutes. To improve the quality of your frozen product, remove water by spinning in a salad spinner, placing on paper towels or clean towels. Excess water creates clumped greens that are hard to break up and use and can cause a loss of quality. Pack into freezer grade material, remove as much air as possible, and leave a half an inch of headspace for the expansion that occurs during freezing. Label, date, and freeze in your freezer that's set at zero degrees. Greens can be frozen using the tray method in individual clumps. Greens and other frozen vegetables should be used within eight months. Frozen greens can be used in your favorite recipes, including soups, stews, casseroles, gumbos, or even simply served as a side dish to accompany any of your meals. UMaine Cooperative Extension is your go-to resource for the latest USDA recommendations for home canning, freezing, and drying. Check out our website for food preservation information, including hands-on, preserving the harvest workshops near you, publications from our Let's Preserve series, books, pressure gauge testing services, and more. Thanks. So once you have a freezer full of frozen greens, oftentimes we get the question, well, how do I use them? So what I like about um, the video that you just shot, saw is that it demonstrates how to freeze greens using the tray method so that what you have available are smaller volumes of greens. And these can easily be used in the very popular green smoothies um, that a lot of people are drinking now. And also think of how you could use those in, for example, a spinach dip, one of those dips that are very popular um, during the football season, potlucks and tailgating parties. Um, so this is really some good examples of, of how to use those frozen greens in addition to the examples that were given, such as um, in a soup, in a casserole, etc. cetera. Um, one of our favorite humane recipes using greens is called a crustless spinach pie. You can use any kind of greens in this recipe and it makes for a great breakfast or light summer dinner. And best of all, you don't even have to make a pie crust. So we're gonna watch this video to learn how to make the crustless spinach pie.
We'd like to thank our colleagues with UMaine Extension's FNET program for sharing that video with us. A another great thing about that recipe is that it also uses eggs, which if you're um, someone who has laying hands at home, this is certainly a time of year when you have plenty of eggs on hand. So eggs and greens, great, great recipe to use when you have plenty of those on hand. An important thing to know when using greens is that, as you saw in both the blanching video, um, they do reduce significantly in volume when they are cooked. So we want to talk a little bit about how to substitute cooked greens for fresh greens. You can see a picture here that shows um, what, and this is kale, looked like pre-cooking and post-cooking and it significantly reduces. Um, for example, here we have eight cups of fresh greens that reduced to under two cups when they were steamed for just three minutes. So the rule of thumb is when you're substituting cooked greens for fresh greens, you wanna cut the volume down to a quarter cup of those cooked greens, or if you're taking them from your freezer, per one cup of fresh greens. So for example, if we've got a recipe that calls for two cups of fresh greens, you would substitute just a half a cup of those cooked or those frozen greens. So we're gonna launch our first poll to test your knowledge of substituting greens. So the question in our first poll is, if a recipe calls for four cups of fresh greens, how much frozen greens or cooked greens would you use? I can see that the poll is still quite active, so we'll give you a few minutes to have you add in your answer, your response. And we'll count down five, four, three, two, one. And we can share the results of that poll. And we sure do have a sharp group of folks with us today. Uh, the correct answer is one cup. So again, that would be four cups of fresh greens. You would substitute with one cup of either cooked or those frozen greens from your freezer. So great job, everyone. Uh, what we'd like to do now is move to our Q&A. And if anyone has asked any questions in our Q&A box, we're going to invite Lori in to ask those questions of us. We have a couple of great questions so far. The first one is, could you recap the blanching times for greens? Sure, and remember, you're gonna get that video link too. So you'll be able to rewatch that as much as you want. Um, the blanching time for most greens is a quick two minutes. However, collard greens, which are uh, you know, a, a, a tougher textured type of green, they require three minutes. And what's also important to remember when we're talking about freezing is that that cooling off in an ice bath for the same amount of time that you blanched for is a very important step to improve the overall quality of your, of your frozen product because it stops the cooking, which helps to prevent it from getting mushy, which is a common complaint that we have heard from people around um, frozen vegetables. Sometimes they think they get mushy, so we encourage people to remember to use that um, ice bath to stop the cooking. Thank you. Our next question is, what can you use instead of a single use freezer bag? Oh, great question. So we have, um, there are lots of products that are available on the market that are intended to be washed and reused. So you're going to want to look for things that are sold as freezer grade containers. And you can find those at large department stores. Your local um, hardware store may carry them as well. You can always shop online. But remember to look for freezer grade, which is a higher grade, higher quality than just a storage grade container. OK. 
All right. Our next question, did you actually immerse the greens in the boiling water or was the water underneath the greens providing steam to blanch the greens? So typically you use um, a gallon of water per pound of vegetables. We all know greens are a little light and fluffy though. Um, so in the video, you could see that I added a volume of prepared greens to boiling water and they did submerge as they cooked. So the blancher pot does expose them to boiling water, not just steam. Okay, it looks like that's all we have for questions right now. Um, feel free to type those in if you think of some later though. Um, just gonna do a quick double check. Yes, that's our last question for right now. Okay, thanks. So next up in our webinar is Kate McCarty and she's gonna take us through preserving rhubarb. Great, thank you. So freezing rhubarb is a simple and easy way to use it later, whether you're cooking with it or using it in your preserving projects. And I'm gonna demonstrate how to put it up in your freezer, which is one of my favorite springtime preserving projects. I also love freezing greens, but I do admit that it can be a little bit labor intensive. And so it is very refreshing to turn to rhubarb, um, which is very simple. So before we get into the demo, I wanna show you all um, the rhubarb chutney that I made, a rhubarb orange chutney even. Um, so I made this using the frozen rhubarb that I had from last spring, um, just a month ago, two months ago now in March, um, when I decided it was time to start emptying out the freezer of some of those spring and summertime fruits. Um, so that is one of my favorite products. I canned it using frozen rhubarb and we'll be sure to share the recipe with you. It's from the Ball Blue Book. Okay, so for rhubarb, if you're growing your own, um, you wanna harvest it by pulling the stalks from the base using a twisting motion, or you can cut them um, at the base of the stalk with some clippers or a sharp knife. And then you wanna remove the leaves from the rhubarb stalks and discard them because they are poisonous, um, but they're okay to, to go into your compost. And then if you're buying rhubarb, you wanna look for bright shiny stalks that aren't woody inside or wilted. Um, and then red or green, the color doesn't make a difference. They both deliver that same great tart flavor that we're after. All right, so now on to this super simple demo on how to freeze rhubarb. Got my cutting board set up here that hopefully you can all see. So to prepare your rhubarb for freezing, the first step is to trim the ends. Um, if you harvest it from your own plant, you might have a little bit of the base of the plant on there if you didn't cut it. So trim that off, wash everybody up, um, and then just simply cut it into pieces. So the pieces that you can cut can vary between a quarter inch or a full inch, keeping in mind what you're gonna do with the product when you use it. So smaller, pieces if you're going to use them in muffins, quick breads, etc. If you're going to use it in a preserving project like that chutney I mentioned, jam, or a sauce, it's all going to break down when you heat it. So you could cut it into larger, say one inch pieces to use in future preserving projects. All right, so once you've cut all your rhubarb up, You want to pack it into those freezer grade containers that Kathy reviewed. And then the tray method is nice too. So this is spreading out on a tray, freezing, say overnight, so at least 24 hours, so it's nice and solid, spreading out in a single layer, freezing it and then coming back and packaging it up. So this allows all of the pieces to freeze individually. And then when they're in the package, they won't stick together and it makes it easier to use. But the best tip that I have for you is to measure your rhubarb before you freeze it. So once you have all your rhubarb cut up, I just take a one cup measurer and use it to portion out the rhubarb into my freezer grade zip top bag that I'm using. 
So then I would add the information of how much is in each bag onto it with the label and the date. So this is two cups measured. But either way, make sure you don't fill your containers more than two thirds full to allow for the product to expand as it freezes. And then you're gonna press all the air out, seal it up, and then freeze it in a freezer that's set at zero degrees Fahrenheit for your best quality. And if you are doing a lot of rhubarb, it's important not to remember not to overload your freezer, um, which could cause it to freeze more slowly and result in a lower quality product. Um, rhubarb is recommended to store for eight months for best quality in the freezer. Um, but remember that the, the safety of this product comes from the temperature of your freezer. So if you do happen to have rhubarb that's older than eight months, um, but it still looks like it's in good shape, it's still safe to eat. So you can see the zip top bag I used here as well as a vacuum sealed package. Um, and if we could go back to our slideshow, yeah, you can see um, I've got a picture of my vacuum sealer there for you. These are great appliances um, to preserve frozen greens, rhubarb, anything else you're gonna encounter throughout the season that you wanna freeze. Um, they draw all of the air out of the bags and then seal them, which helps to keep ice crystals from forming. So anecdotally, everyone I speak to absolutely loves their vacuum sealer. Um, that they help preserve the quality of your frozen product for longer, but they do, or they are expensive. So the, the most inexpensive model I've seen is $100 and then they go up from there. And they have these proprietary bags that you need to use, um, which are also more pricey than the, the zip top bags. Um, so you'll have to decide if that's an investment for you, um, but you could also keep an eye out for them at secondhand shops and yard sales because people will often unload them in those places. All right, so that's it for freezing rhubarb, but Kathy is gonna tell you then what you can do with it. Great, thanks Kate. So once you've got your freezer filled with rhubarb for the season, it's great to use in lots of tasty recipes. Oftentimes we think of using rhubarb in baked recipes. Here we have some pictures of pies, um, also a rhubarb spoon cake um, that's pre-baked and then after it's baked and also a, a rhubarb crisp. So typically lots of dessert recipes are what we use our rhubarb for. However, you can also use rhubarb in preserving recipes. These include conserves, chutneys, jams, simple syrups, and shrubs. Also consider barbecue sauces, stewed rhubarb, shrubs, um, and you can see some photos here of some things that we've done this year already with our um, abundant rhubarb crop. Um, that is a simple syrup of rhubarb on the left, and then also a rhubarb conserve on the right. Remember, there are some really great tasting rhubarb combinations. I think a lot of people may prefer to have rhubarb perhaps with strawberries instead of just straight up rhubarb. It can be a little tart for folks. Um, one of my favorite combinations is rhubarb with ginger. Um, and one that has become increasingly popular here in Maine is called blue barb, which is a combination of blueberries, hopefully our great wild Maine blueberries, and rhubarb. Rhubarb can really help to extend some of those other um, fruits that you may need to buy or go to a pick your own site. And if you have a rhubarb patch in your own backyard, there you have it. You can extend um, the volume and reduce the cost overall for what you may be preparing um, with the combination. So we want to encourage you to mark your calendar to tune in for our upcoming webinars in June, where we will be covering some of these fun topics, such as jams and jellies, including how to make those low sugar jams and jellies. And also, I think it's going to be super popular, our drinks from the garden, where we'll you know, take a dive into talking about um, shrubs and how to make the simple syrups and what to do with those, just in time for the 4th of July. So we'd like to recap with another poll to assess um, how well you were listening to Kate during her demonstration. 
So our second poll will launch and the question is, which color rhubarb stalk is sweeter? Is it that red one, the green one, or does the color make absolutely no difference? So we've had quite a few people vote and it looks like you sure are some sharp listeners. We'll share the poll results. It looks like they're up and you are absolutely able to let us know that you are listening because the color does make no difference. So let's check in with Lori and see if there are any additional questions in the Q&A box about freezing and using rhubarb. We do, we have some great questions. The first question is, are there any extra tips for extra fat rhubarb stalks? Should they be treated any differently? No, they can be treated just the same as the, um, the smaller kind of more tender seeming ones. I was curious about the color and then the size of the rhubarb stalk. So um, I did the research in that um, publication about growing rhubarb and the advice is that it all tastes the same and as long as the texture is good so as stalks get bigger or plants get older you might find some that are woody inside um, which i've experienced and is unpleasant so um, just make sure that the quality is good and then the size and the color don't matter okay so which is a better harvesting technique for rhubarb the twisting motion or cutting at the base both are fine. There's um, the only downside that um, you could have to cutting them is if you're cutting from multiple plants, you could be inadvertently spreading disease from plant to plant. Um, so try and avoid harvesting from multiple plants if you're concerned about that or just stick with the pulling gently um, and kind of twisting as you go from the base of the plant. Um, our next question is, do ice crystals ruin the rhubarb that is frozen? I wouldn't say they ruin it. Maybe you just could give it some off flavors and introduce some additional water that you don't want in your final product. What I would do is if you had um, a batch of rhubarb that maybe had outgrown its shelf life in the freezer and it is particularly crystally, is to, to rinse it under some cool water in a colander so that that uh, maybe off flavored ice and then water will run off your rhubarb product um, and down the drain so that you don't incorporate it into what you're you're cooking or preserving. Um, and then you could even try a bite to make sure it doesn't have that that signature freezer flavor that you wouldn't want to come through in your final product of course. So taste as you go. <laughs> so we have the same question from several folks what's a shrub and what do you mean by rhubarb shrubs? So Kathy is the shrub expert, so I'll let her, her answer that. Although I will say we are, it's a type of drink and we are going to be detailing it in depth in Drinks from the Garden um, at the end of June, but we'll let you in on the overview if Kathy, you wanna weigh in. Sure, um, and again, this will just be a tease because we, we hope that you'll tune into our webinar um, towards the end of June where we will take a deeper dive into looking at some of these really fun and very flavorful um, drinks that you can make from things in your garden and also uh, from some foraging. So shrubs are really, um, you, you could do a history project on shrubs, uh, learning more about how they have been incorporated into the food culture over many, many years. But they are a way to um, extract flavor from your product, your fruit, whatever it is that you're using. And in combination with the flavor that's drawn from the, the product, you also mix in some vinegar um, and sugar, and it results in a very exciting flavor burst um, that you can com also combine with seltzer and perhaps some other um, alcohol if you wish um, to come up with a really fun cocktail or mocktail. So again, we will talk more about that later on. And it is a creative approach to 
um, finding new ways to use things that are in your garden. Okay. The next question is, how long did you say you can keep rhubarb in the freezer for best quality and how long in the fridge? So in the freezer, it's recommended up to eight months for best quality. And then in the fridge, it's recommended to use within one week. And how do you know when to pluck the stalk? I'd say the time of year. So springtime, as long as your rhubarb is hardy and healthy, um, if you're growing it for the first time, they want you to, it's recommended to wait a few years before you start heavily harvesting it so that it can become established. But if you're talking about a well-established plant, um, it's ready to go as soon as it's, you know, fully grown out of the ground. So around this time of year. Um, and then later on in the year, um, you might find that the flavor isn't as good. So the plant might begin to move into different stages of its um, life cycle and put up a flowering stem. And that can cause um, changes in plants, um, much like any other plant you grow in your, your garden. Once it starts to bolt in reaction to the heat, temperature, light, um, it can cause changes in the, the flavor of it. So I'd say June, early July is perfect rhubarb harvesting time. Our next question involves possibly a horticulture um, question. It says, any tips on where to plant rhubarb? I have planted it three times in different locations and cannot get it to take. That is a horticulture question. And Lori, do you have any advice for, for them? Um, my advice actually is the um, resource list that we're providing has some great tips on where and what soil conditions your rhubarb might like. Um, I think the bulletin number is 2154, but it'll, in, it'll be included in the resources um, from the webinar today. So. Um, our next question is, can you use the ball jam and jelly maker with rhubarb? Oh, that's a great question. And I actually don't have a lot of experience with the ball jam and jelly maker. We do have a lot of um, appliances for home canning, but that is not one of them. Kathy, do you have anything to weigh in on the jam and jelly maker? Um, no, I, and like you, I, it's not something that we've had in our kitchen. So I don't have a lot, of, I don't have any experience using it. But what I would say is, as long as you use a recipe that comes from a reliable source, that it would be, you know, safe from that perspective. So again, we use our Let's Preserve series. We also have, um, rely on our USDA Complete Guide to Home Canning, and then the ever popular So Easy to Preserve book. And, and also the Ball Blue Book does have some rhubarb recipes in it. So I guess Kate and I will both have to sharpen up our skills on, on that and looks like we'll be wanting to purchase that to, to get to try it out. I'm sure if you can find a, a recipe that uses the ball pectin um, that, that you can use it in that appliance, you would just have to look on their website perhaps for the exact instructions. Okay. I am trying to um, toggle back and forth between the Q&A and the chat um, because I believe we have some good questions in the chat as well. Um, and I wanna get to those folks. Um, the first question is, store-bought frozen greens aren't blanched. Have you ever tried or heard of using dry ice to attempt a flash freeze at home with raw vegetables? I have never used dry ice. I've never heard of that in any of the recommendations. But the topic that you do bring up is around the importance of how quickly something gets frozen and the, um, you know, the quality that is, you're going to impart with a flash freeze approach. So we want to make sure and remind people that you do not want to overwhelm your freezer with a lot of foods that need to be frozen and you wanna only freeze 
um, two to three pounds of product per cubic foot of your freezer space in any 24 hour period. So that is gonna help your freezer to be able to quickly freeze those foods so that um, you're creating small ice crystals, um, which will result in a higher quality product. The longer it takes something to freeze, um, the bigger the ice crystals are formed in the product and that can deteriorate the cell wall and result in some textural issues that you may not be happy with, primarily some mushy vegetables. Okay, another question that we have is pertaining to rhubarb salt. Um, any experience or recipes for that? Um, so flavored salts and sugars, again, overlap with our drinks from the garden uh, lesson. So those are something that, yeah, you can um, dehydrate a product, finely grind it, and then mix it with either salt or sugar um, to add to the rim of your jar of your glass um, for a special little kick on a cocktail or a mocktail. Um, they're also great for, I mean, you can use them in cooking as well. Um, I know Kathy's brother-in-law does a lot of dehydrated tomatoes. And then we were discussing how you could um, finely grind them and create these vegetable powders that you could um, mix together with other dried vegetables um, and add salt or sugar to use to, to boost your cooking or make a dip. Um, the possibilities are endless. So yeah, there's a lot of fun ideas with flavored salts and sugars. Will you be going over um, syrups in that same webinar? For instance, the rhubarb syrup. Yes, we'll talk about how to make flavored simple syrups too. We're, all, we're gonna, so in Drinks from the Garden, we're really excited because you can see we've got a lot of great ideas. We're gonna cover shrubs, simple syrups, um, garnishes, juices, um, the flavored salts and syrups, as well as kefir a water kefir, which are little grains that help to create um, a flavored effervescent beverage and kombucha. So there's gonna be a lot there. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, could you repeat how many cubic feet of space is needed in a freezer for the two to three pounds of product? So the recommendation is that you should freeze no more than two to three pounds of product per cubic foot of your freezer. Now, you can typically find the cubic foot of your freezer. If you open up your, your freezer, you will see there's a sticker or a label somewhere in that. It may also be in your refrigerator section, but it will clearly identify in cubic feet the space in your freezer. Okay. Um, I just want to let everyone know once again that if we did not get to your question, that for sure they will be answered by email. Great. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, great to have a group with us that came up with a lot of questions today. It's fun to have that back and forth. Um, so here is the information on our recommended resources. And again, you'll get all of these resources included in the follow-up email that you will get, um, we're hoping for today, if not today, by tomorrow. So they include links to our Let's Preserve Leafy Greens, how to preserve fresh greens with a you know, retake on watching that video, also the mainly dish, um, and then vegetables and fruits for health. And then we did have a number of questions on how to grow rhubarb. And so we will be including that UMaine extension publication that will give you tips and advice on how to you know, have a great rhubarb crop in years to come. I know my rhubarb plant was just transplanted and I, I, I can tell already that I don't have it in a, a sunny enough spot. So looks like I'll be moving it again soon. So that's it for our resources. Kate? So last week we launched our Preserving Coach program where if you're interested, if you're a new preserver and you're interested in learning how to preserve, you can be paired with one of our master food preserver volunteers. So these volunteers we have worked with Kathy and I to 
learn all aspects of home food preservation. Um, and then they are trained to go out in their communities and deliver this home food preservation education. So due to our lack of uh, community events this summer, we're looking for some virtual volunteering opportunities. And we thought teaching newbies how to preserve would be a great one. So if you're looking to work more one-on-one -on -one with somebody throughout the growing season, they can provide support to you by phone calls, FaceTime, texting, email, whatever um, method works for the two of you. Um, and perhaps even in person if, that's, um, if you're comfortable with that, if we're allowed to do that later on in the season. So if you're interested, you can see my email address on the screen there. Shoot me an email and I'll actually be the one sending you the follow-up resources so you could even reply directly to that email. Um, we're going to make this available to Maine residents, but that said, we still have um, plenty of room within the program. So if you're interested in being um, paired with a master food preserver, preserving coach, shoot me an email. So next week, we'll be back same time, 2 p.m. Eastern, to discuss how to use a boiling water bath for canning so that you're ready for strawberry season. And then later in June, we'll show you how to preserve strawberries, including the low sugar options. Um, and then the week after that, herbs. And then finally, the <laughs> drinks from the garden. Um, we are continuing this season through, or this webinar through the end of October. So we'll have July topics um, announced soon. So look for those registrations in your follow-up email. We'll also share a link to a Qualtrics evaluation and a certificate of completion for today. And if you're in the US and are interested in receiving a Headspace measuring tool, um, we have plenty to give out. This is a tool that's used in canning. And if you tune in next week, we're gonna tell you all about why you need it and when you use it. And we will send you one for free in the mail. And if you were um, requested one last week, know that we're gonna get those out to you, in the mail to you today. All right, Lori, we have a few minutes, one more minute for questions. Do you wanna do a sweep of the Q&A box and pick one more good one for us before we sign off? Yeah, that would be great. Actually, it's kind of clarification on that previous question um, regarding freezer space. Is that of total space or available space per cubic feet? That is total space because it would speak to um, what your freezer is equipped to, to do. So it's not just the available space, it's what the, the cubic feet, how it is described in the sticker in your freezer. All right, um, oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to um, let folks know that you can, we, we're encouraged people to register for these events, even if you can't watch it at the time that it is being aired live, because you once registered, you will receive all of our resources and you will also receive a link to the recorded webinar. So just wanna clear that up in case there's been any confusion out there. Okay. And the next um, question, I have a couple, and it's kind of a shameless plug for all of the preserving program that is offered. Um, I have a question about asking if um, adult ed classes are offered, and how do you become a master food preserver? So typically we teach um, in, with our in partnership with our local adult eds, um, you know, this year is a little different. So we're all sorting out how to um, offer these workshops. So right now, what the consistent thing we have is to be here Tuesdays at two, um, offering a seasonal topic through the end of October. So every week, so we've got another 23 weeks until then. Um, and then we'll have to see individually about working with local adult eds, but I can picture, um, yeah, adapting something to, to virtual or perhaps in person in small groups if we're allowed. And then the Master Food Preserver Program, um, something Kathy Savoy teaches, she teaches it here in Cumberland County. Um, and this year has been postponed due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so if you are interested, you can email us and we'll put you on an interest list. So we have an application process in the spring and then the course runs June through early September. Um, so we'll let you know when the applications for that process become available for 2021.
Okay, I can see I went over my time, so I'm going to discontinue my questions. So we'll follow up in a, um, the email with any of the unaddressed questions as best we can. So thank you all for joining us. This was really fun, and we will see you here next Tuesday at 2 p.m. Thanks.